Thanks, Adam. Uh, what you said about LA Film Forum, including non-commercial film, I think fits perfectly for Medium Cool because it was extremely non-commercial, mostly because Paramount decided not to distribute the film <laughs> and pulled it from distribution and it really didn't have a theatrical life. 20 years um, ago at USC, there was a, a graduate student organized event, multi-day, multi, like a week-long thing. It was May 68, 20 years later. And one of the highlights was to get the 35 print. At that point, Paramount did have a 35 millimeter print. <laughs> and we showed it in 35 and Haskell was there and he talked about it and afterwards he asked if he could go back into the, into the projection room. This was in a building that no longer exists at USC and I escorted him back there at which point he picked up the, th the 35 print one in one hand and one in the other uh, big heavy boxes and he absconded, and I said, where are you going? He said, this is my film, and I'm, I'm, ta I'm liberating. He used that word, I'm liberating this film. <laughs> and it took many phone calls to get this straightened out, because at that point, USC Film School w stood to lose bar borrowing privileges, not just from Paramount, but from every studio in town, because the word would have got, gotten out, you can't lend those guys a 35 print. You won't get it back. Eventually, we got it back. Haskell decided that he had made his stand and that was good enough. <laughs> but I think it's, it's, it's not just an apocryphal tale. When you see the film now, it's easy to understand why Paramount wasn't happy. It was owned by Gulf and Western Corporation at that time. And originally the film was to have been made in New York and it, it had a roughly it's the same, more or less a kind of the narrative would have been somewhat the same. <coughs> except towards the end and near the sh beginning of the shooting, Haskell, who's from Chicago, realized that he had to make this film and he had to set it in Chicago, not New York. Why? Because of what Adam just said about the Chicago, Demo the Democratic National Convention that was being held in Chicago and the planning that was going into all the demonstrations, some of them by the Yippies and some by other factions, SDS, Students for Democratic Society and lots of others. It's all in the film. And uh, because of that, he realized the film could only be made in Chicago. I've always thought about this film as a kind of confrontation of fiction and nonfiction. That's why I've been excited about the film for many years and I've written about it because I think it's one of those times when a, when a filmmaker, and he did make another, he was blackballed basically after making this film and after doing uh, the, the problems with Paramount. He didn't make another film until Latino in 1985. And he always said he was blackballed because of that. Of course he continued to shoot and got another Academy Award as a cinematographer for Bound for Glory, but it, it wasn't possible for him to write, direct, and shoot as he did with Medium Cool again until Latino. Um, what I want to say about this, a couple of things, as I said, a kind of confrontation between fiction and nonfiction, and I think it's super interesting to think about how that contestation, how that battle turns out in the course of the film. Keep in mind, and many of you in this audience know something about what happened in the streets of Chicago in August of 1968, some of you may not know so much, but afterwards the Kern Commission, in doing a report about what, what happened, termed this as a police riot, meaning that the instigators of much of the violence that occurred between pitch battles between young people, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the student movement, etc., and the Chicago Police Department and National Guard was promulgated according to the Kern Commission by Daly's forces. He was Richard Daly was the mayor of Chicago and was for many years and was the head of a very powerful political machine in Chicago and he had made it very clear that his city was not going to be invaded and this wasn't happening on his watch. And so what happens and what we see in this film was described later as a police riot. Um, 
I want to say a few things about Yippee also. I mean, uh, it's a film that I haven't seen in a while. I'm happy that it's in distribution. I'm happy that LA Film Forum is showing it. The Yippee stands, Yip was Youth International Party. It was founded by some of the people whose names many of you I'm sure know, others may not, Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Paul Krasner, and a handful of others. And they, in 1968, famously ran a pig for president. They were on the side of, I would say, anarchism and street theater and guerrilla theater. They were provo provocateurs, although in that melange of 1968, the people who were the very serious politicos, the SDS types like Tom Hayden and Dave, De and Dave Dellinger, who was a pacifist, they, it all kind of got mixed up. They all became part of the famous trial that started out as the Chicago 8, because it included Bobby Seale, and then was separated off and became the Chicago 7 trial, and it went on for a very long time. But this is what's happening. It's a cauldron, and there are a lot, there's a lot happening and this is a film, maybe the best film I can think of, that really gives an idea of what the experience was like on the streets. And the confrontation between the story that unfolds for us and what happens is, for me, I think of it largely in terms of, well, Hollywood films generally we think about where is it set? What's the background? In this case, background and foreground flip places. Because the background is supposed to be just be a passive setting. But in this case, the background comes to the foreground, especially in the last 20 or 25 minutes of the film. And, and that, for me, is what makes this film so special. It was added to the National Film Registry, part of the Library of Congress initiative to save some films for perpetuity. And interestingly, for LA Film Forum's purposes, it was added to the National Film Registry the same year as Hollis Frampton's Nostalgia, <laughs> 2003. So they, they, there's, a, there's a kinship of some <laughs> sort there, I think. Um, and the other thing is, just in terms of the kind of nonfiction qualities, there are moments in the film that are not simply the flipping of foreground and background, but are really more like direct address to the camera, which is the breaking down of the the, f the invisible fourth wall so that you get real direct address and at that point it seems l as though we're in the middle of either a Brechtian theatrical production or some kind of didactic moment in the course of the film and that too feels at cross purposes with the kind of fiction that we are accustomed to for feature films, especially those produced by Paramount Pictures in hopes of seeing some profits from which, no, they did not, but it's in the National Film Registry. The Criterion Collection added it as one of their films that is a quintessential film for American film history, and I hope you enjoy both Yippee and uh, mm -hmm. Medium Cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we'll just go right through, and uh, thank you all for coming, and as I mentioned, we won't have a Q&A since Medium Cool is on the long side, uh, and enjoy. <laughs>